Welcome to episode 256 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my award-winning books, blog, and podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Tommy McDonald, who served in the FBI for 25 years, 21 as a special agent and four as an investigative specialist. In this episode, Tommy reviews the 37-year-long manhunt for top 10 most wanted fugitive and cop killer, Donald Eugene Webb. Webb was wanted for the December 1980 murder of Saxonburg, Pennsylvania, Chief of Police Gregory Adams. The story of where and how they found Donald Eugene Webb is an amazing tale. Tommy McDonald's first office assignment was to the New York City field office, where for eight years, he was assigned to the FBI NYPD Violent Crime Squad, also known as the Joint Bank Robbery Task Force. In October 2010, Tommy was one of two agents selected to work what was then the 14-year unresolved fugitive investigation for James Whitey Bolger. At the conclusion of that assignment, Tommy was transferred to the White Plains RA, our resident agency, where he worked on a 65-defendant RICO gang case in Yonkers. In September 2012, Tommy accepted a Office of Preference assignment to the Portland, Maine resident agency out of the Boston Division where for eight years, besides working on the Donald Eugene Webb fugitive case, he was a member of the FBI's child abduction and rapid deployment team investigating child predator cases. Tommy also worked on one of the largest art heists in New England's history and a multi-defendant healthcare fraud investigation. Before retiring from the FBI, Tommy spent his final year serving as the recruiter for the Boston field office. Currently, he is employed in software sales as a regional sales manager for ULAB Systems. Now, before we get to the interview, I want to remind reader team members that I sent out my monthly email on Monday, April the 4th. In that email, I asked for your suggestions for special guests and stories for the 50th anniversary of female FBI agents episodes I'll be producing. And I also give you a sneak peek at the custom artwork I had designed for the anniversary. Now, if my email is not in your inbox, you know what to do. Check your spam filter and promotion tab. I want to welcome new listeners. In your podcast app's description of this episode, there are links to where you can join my reader team to keep up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies, buy me a coffee, and visit my website to learn more about me and my nonfiction and crime fiction books. I want to thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, Tommy McDonald. Hey, Tommy, how are you? Hey, Jerry, how you doing? I'm doing great. I'm really excited about this case review because we're going to talk about Donald Eugene Webb, the second longest person to be on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. So where do you want to start? Well, I think the best way to start would probably be to start with the actual crime. And that was on December 4th of 1980 just short of three o'clock in the afternoon in the town of Saxonburg, Pennsylvania. Saxonburg is located in the western side of Pennsylvania. It's about 45 minutes northeast of Pittsburgh. The nearest big town is Butler. It's actually in Butler County. It's a small, beautiful Pennsylvania town. It's got a population of about 1,500 people. Matter of fact, the founders of Saxonburg were the Roebling brothers who were well known for developing suspension wiring, which is what they use actually on the Brooklyn Bridge. And this case started with one of the most fundamental aspects of law enforcement, which is a police officer pulling over a car for a traffic violation. That occurred on December 4th, 1980. Young Chief Adams, 31-year-old chief of police, 
One of two cops in Saxonburg sees a guy run a stop sign. He pulls him over just off of Main Street, right as school's coming out of session into an Agway parking lot, kind of a hardware store parking lot, which is kind of around the corner from the center of town. Chief Adams approached the vehicle. He asked the driver for his license. And what the investigators at the time believe happened was a struggle ensued where the driver of the car got out and pulled out a pistol and got a jump on the chief, walked him back to the rear part of the lot. And then an all-out fight took place where the chief was struck several times in the face with his own revolver, his own 38 Smith & Wesson, was shot twice in the chest. He was found in the yard of a neighbor clinging on to life and was transported by ambulance to Butler Hospital and died en route to Butler Hospital. His partner, the only other cop in town, Gordon Mainhart, was in the back of the ambulance with Chief Adams. They had a quick conversation. What happened? He said it was a traffic violation. Who was it? I don't know who it was. It was a white male, which is actually significant in a small town. Often these cops know everyone, right? His last words were, pray for me, and he passed away in the back of the ambulance. It was a uh, very revealing crime scene, Jerry. There was two blood types found, type A, which belonged to Chief Adams, and type O positive, which belonged to the subject. A 25 caliber Colt gun was recovered at the scene, and the chief's uh, 38 Smith & Wesson revolver was missing. The Mike kid in his patrol car had actually been ripped out and thrown on the ground, and a piece of paper from a pad in the patrol car, which we believe the chief was writing down the license plate number, had been ripped out and taken. The crime scene itself was extensive, and the most significant item recovered at the crime scene was found the next morning. There had been some snowfall that night in Saxonburg as the scene was being processed. They put some of it off till daylight. And at that time, they found a New Jersey driver's license with the name Stanley J. Portis of Phillipsburg, New Jersey. And back then, driver's licenses did not have a photograph. And that turned out to be the single most crucial piece of evidence from that crime scene. Of course, in addition to the chief statements, there were witness statements. There were school bus drivers driving by that witnessed the assault. And there was uh, a couple other people driving by and they saw a white male getting into a white car attending to a leg wound. And that was about it. Chief Adams was 31 years old at the time he was killed. He was a married father of two young sons. He was not a big guy. He was 5'7", 150 pounds. He was a native of Natrona Heights, Pennsylvania. And sadly, he had been a cop in Washington, D.C. earlier. If it wasn't his partner, it was a close member of the force, was killed in the line of duty. And he made the decision to go back to small town policing. He felt it would be safer. Wow. Uh, kind of it. Yeah, it's kind of a uh, reminder to all of us that when you choose to be in law enforcement, you really sign up for a career where you may pay the ultimate sacrifice. Mm, so true. So the initial case team was a state police detective named Jim Poydens who was assigned to the Butler Barracks, and Pete McCann was the FBI agent out of Pittsburgh. Pete was assigned to the Northern RA there north of Pittsburgh. I think it might have been the Newcastle RA at the time. And ironically, Pete and Jim are still close. They've, they've become friends of mine, but they're still friends. They still work together in an investigative business. They never forgot this case, and that's something we'll talk about today as I go through the case review. It took the state police and the FBI about two to three weeks to identify the driver of the car. And they backtracked through gumshoe detective work. They backtracked the Portis ID and they found that it was issued on March 13th, 1980 in New Jersey, and that the real Stanley Portis had died in 1956. The driver's license was obtained via a Massachusetts birth certificate and a visa credit card. The more they looked into the credit card, they saw that a woman named Lillian Webb had been used as a credit reference for that card. Back then, you had to mail driver's licenses to an address. They ended up finding out it was mailed to a woman who had been a waitress at a place called the Peak Inn, Phillipsburg, New Jersey, on the western part of Jersey, right across from eastern Pennsylvania. They located her. She initially lied, and then she admitted she met these two guys that were in the junk jewelry business, and they paid her some money to have the license mailed to her house. In addition, they found that Portis, as Webb, had gotten a DWI arrest in Virginia. Back then, you didn't get fingerprinted for a DWI arrest but they located that as well. They also tied the credit card that they had to rental car records. As you're talking, it's amazing to get an understanding of how little identification it took to get a driver's license back then, because now you got to come in with six points of identification and all of this stuff. And all he had was a birth certificate and a credit card. That's right. And things were different back then. And also, I mean, you remember even as an agent, how long it used to take. I started in 2000 and I remember getting a driver's license photo for a subject or a witness oftentimes could take three or four days. Yeah. 
Yeah. And back then, as you're explaining, they didn't even have photos, at least in New Jersey. Yep. And you'll see photos played a big part in this investigation. 17 days after the murder, prior to the identification of Webb as Portis, a Mercury Cougar was located at a Howard Johnson's. That's another one. Remember the Howard Johnson's? It was located at a Howard Johnson's parking lot in Warwick, Rhode Island, right off of I-95. So this Western Pennsylvania case kind of started moving east to New England. The car had been cleaned out and the FBI ERT back, I don't know if they were called ERT, but the FBI processed, came up from the lab and processed the vehicle. There was like a softball sized blood stain on the lower floor mat on the driver's side where the left leg would have ran down. So that was indicative of the leg injury. Some of the witnesses saw the subject attending to an O positive blood was found. That was the blood type with that stain. We ended up getting Webb's fingerprints on the rental car records. The car was rented in Taunton, Massachusetts, south of Boston. On Christmas Eve, 1980, three and a half weeks after the murder, a murder one warrant was obtained by trooper Detective Poydens. And on New Year's Eve, 1980, a UFAP warrant, which is the unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. And for folks listening who are not law enforcement, the UFAP warrants are a result of the Fugitive Felon Act and Section 1073 of Title 18. And it's a tool. It allows federal law enforcement to assist local or state law enforcement in apprehending someone that's left the jurisdiction where the warrant is obtained. Webb is identified right around Christmas and it's the murder of a small town police chief. This is an important case. Who was our fugitive? Donald Eugene Webb was born, Donald Eugene Perkins, actually, on July 14th of 1931 in Oklahoma City. He was raised in Kansas City in California. I was 49 years old at the time of the car stop. So he had almost 20 years on Chief Adams. He was a little bit taller and a little bit bigger. He had been in the United States Air Force and he was discharged out of the Otis Air Force Base in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He had done time for federal bank robbery. He was pretty much a career burglar. He was a well-dressed guy. He was mild-mannered. Him and the guys he hung out with, they were big into burglarizing jewelry stores and residences of wealthy people. They were the type of crew that if they were having a funeral in town for a doctor and the obituary was in the newspaper, they would case the house and burglarize the house at the time of the funeral and then sell the, sell the jewels that they took. Oh, that's that they, cold. That's cold. Yeah. I like to describe them as when criminals were criminals. One of the agents I'm going to talk about today, Phil Torsney, who's a very good friend of mine, he calls them crooks. And Phil's from a different generation of FBI that I was. He was started about 15 years before me. My generation, we never used the term crooks. It seems like every criminal recently is hiding behind an IP address or is addicted to opiates, right? But back in the day, in the 70s and 80s, you had crooks. These are just people who, that was their profession. They were full-time crooks, criminals. That's right. At the time of the car stop in Saxonburg, Webb was the subject of an 88A, which is the FBI's fugitive classification for UFAP cases or fugitives. And he was the subject of, an, of a UFAP case out of the Albany division. Him and a guy named Frank Latch had been arrested for a burglary of a jewelry store in Colony, New York, outside of Albany, and they skipped town. They were fugitives from that case. So they were actually being looked for by the FBI, which explains, Jerry, why he would want to get a jump on Chief Adams because there was a good chance he was going to get identified and go back to jail. A guy who's almost 50 years old that's done time for federal bank robbery, like the last thing he wants to do is go back in. I didn't get that at first. I didn't realize that he was 50 years old at the time. So he had been at this criminal activity for a long, long time. That's right. That's right. He was a member of a group called the Fall River Gang that was dubbed by law enforcement. They would do these burglaries. He had done federal time for bank robbery, and he was loosely connected to the Patriarcha crime family, which I'm just going to talk about in a second. But he had been staying in Western Pennsylvania at the Friendship Inn there. There's a lot of really meaningful stories in this investigation, but while he was a fugitive for the colony case, he had locked his keys in the car and a state trooper from the local barracks that came out and helped him get in his car. And Webb actually dropped off a bottle of scotch for the trooper at the barracks, thanking him. <laughs> oh, God. Amazing, right? Yeah. But but I think Adams would have made an ID. He was a young, aggressive cop. This guy just didn't seem to fit into Saxonburg. The group that Webb was affiliated with, the Fall River Gang, back in that time, the New England mob was run by Raymond Patriarcha out of the Providence area. So much of law enforcement is geography, in my opinion. And if you look at Providence, instead of going north on 95 to Boston, if you make a right on 195, it takes you east. 
And about 15 minutes from Providence, you'll see a town called Fall River, Massachusetts, the city. It was kind of a twin sister city that comes up next, New Bedford, which is a famous whaling city. At one time, it was one of the wealthiest zip codes in the country. And then you run into Cape Cod. And that's kind of where this case was centered back in New England. As you'll see, when I got involved in this investigation, Pete McCann, the agent in Pittsburgh, was a first office agent with an agent named George Bates. And George Bates was assigned to the New Bedford RA, which was at the time a three-man RA in the city of New Bedford where Lillian Webb was based and where Webb was based. They'd actually been married in New Bedford. And Jack McGraw, Jack was another agent that worked there at the time and was involved in this investigation, along with some other agents in the Providence office at the time. Unfortunately, once they identified Webb as the shooter, Lillian Webb was given a heads up. The Pennsylvania State Police contacted the Mass State Police, just like would probably happen today. Lillian was known to one of the members of the state police, and he reached out for her and said, hey, the feds are looking for Don. They think he killed a cop. So she was prepared. And if she had been in touch with Webb, she was prepared to let him know that they had identified him. But you think if Webb had picked up his driver's license instead of ripping the mic head out of the car, And if he had actually picked up his driver's license, he may never have been identified as the killer of this young police chief. Can you imagine what he was thinking when he got back in his car and realized that he had left that driver's license behind? I know. And even the Chief's 38 was found in April of that year when the snow melted in in Winfield Township, Pennsylvania, been thrown into like a farmland. And a father and son had found it. So I'm sure he was desperate and he was suffering. He had an injury. I mean, he was driving back a nine hour trip back to New England and he was definitely suffering in that car ride. As you'll see, there was a lot of supposition in this case that he never actually made it, that he might've died from his injuries. Jack Cicilline was Raymond Patriarca's mob attorney and Jack's still alive. He's still in Providence. His son is a congressman, David Cicilline. Lillian Webb retained Jack Cicilline, right? Showed you what the FBI was dealing with in the early 80s. You have the wife of this wanted fugitive and she's got a mob attorney. In 1986, an Airtel was written by the Bureau. For those of you who remember Airtels, I do not. I'm an EC guy. Oh, no, uh, I remember the Airtels. I came in in 1982. So this is right around my time period. I've read a lot of Airtels because I've worked some older cases and I'm a big fan of the Airtel, to be honest with you. We got to stop for a minute and explain Airtel and ECs. So I don't even know what Airtel stood for, but EC and Airtel were communications that were sent from one office to headquarters or one office to another office explaining details of a particular case and maybe setting out leads for that office to assist on the investigation. That's right. In 1986, Judge Webster has this case reassigned from Pittsburgh to Boston. There was nothing left to do in Pittsburgh. The fugitive was gone. All the investigative work was back in Massachusetts. So in 86, Boston became the OO or Office of Origin, which is another FBI acronym, the lead field office in the investigation, which I don't think is common with top 10 cases. They usually stay in the field office that originates the investigation. But there was really nothing to go on early on. Webb earned the nickname The Ghost because he had just vanished and there was really not a lot of great leads on this case. He was added to the top 10 most wanted list on May 4th of 1981. I was 10 years old at the time and he was removed on March 31st of 2007. He was two months shy of 27 years on the top 10 list. As you mentioned, he's one of the longest running fugitives. And for folks that aren't in the FBI, the top 10 list is really a tool for the Bureau to try and aid investigations in identifying, getting tips and capturing fugitives. There's built-in rewards for top 10 fugitives. It's not common to remove a fugitive from the top 10 list, but the Bureau will make that decision if they feel like membership on that list isn't going to help us find a fugitive. And fortunately for us, most of the fugitives on that list are apprehended. The purpose of putting them on this top most wanted list is to get publicity to get the word out there so that the public is aware that the FBI is looking for them. There's a number of agents wanting to get their fugitives on that list. I guess it's not going to be helpful to keep somebody on. Then they'll just move him off and put another person on that. Being on that list might help with their apprehension. Yeah, and it was reasonable, too, to remove him. He'd been on there 26 years. There were no active leads, and he would have been in his 70s at the time. A lot of people felt like he got shot. You'll find that he did not get shot, but a lot of people thought he might have gotten shot and died of his wounds. And his wife was back in Massachusetts saying, I never saw him. I had no contact with him. There's one other, to my knowledge, 
There's a unit called Leoka, which is a law enforcement killed and assaulted group down at Sejus. Sejus is based in Clarksburg, West Virginia, and it's a criminal justice information systems is my understanding of that acronym. It's an FBI run unit that really helps federal and state law enforcement all across the country. They do a lot of different things to help law enforcement. They told me that there's only one other unresolved homicide of a police chief. It was in 1997. Police chief in Shannon, Mississippi was ambushed by an unknown assailant as he was walking into the barracks. So this was one of two cases at the time. Again, the geography was an issue here because the crime happened in Pittsburgh. This case was really super, not that it wasn't important all over the country, but Pittsburgh was where this case was centered. But now it's being investigated by the Boston Division. So how did I get involved? I'm a 15, 16 year plus agent working at the Portland Main RA and it's an agent named Phil Torsney. Phil and I were partners on the Bolger case in October of 2009. We had gotten asked by executive management in Boston to come to Boston and try and figure out the 15 year unresolved fugitive case for Whitey Bolger, who's a Boston gangster. And Phil and I became friends. We're still close friends. I was in the middle of my career when we went to Boston. Phil was a 20-year agent out of Cleveland, had run the Cleveland Fugitive Task Force. In my judgment, he's one of the top fugitive investigators in the history of the Bureau. And once Bolger got caught, Phil needed something to do, right? And he knew that the Webb case was a Boston case and he resuscitated the case. It was pending an active status and it wasn't being actively worked. There's always a big difference between having an open investigation and an active investigation. Phil ran into mandatory retirement. He did some work on the web case. He went and did some interviews and then he went to Afghanistan for a stint and then he had to retire. And he had been asking me to take over this case. I had transferred from New York City to the Portland Main RA on a PRL transfer. So I was in the Boston division. PRL transfer used to be the OP transfer office of preference, but it's a personnel resource list. And basically to me, That means I did my hard time in New York without complaining. I worked cases. I wasn't calling headquarters every week trying to finagle a transfer. And I eventually got the email, my Blackberry saying, you've been offered a voluntary transfer to the Portland main office out of Boston. The Boston field office is kind of a unique division in the FBI. We cover four states, New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island. So in order to get the job done, we have satellite offices, which the Bureau calls resident agencies. In Maine, we have three. We have Portland, Augusta, and Bangor. In New Hampshire, there's Bedford and Portsmouth. And Massachusetts, there's several. There's one in Springfield, one in Worcester, one in Lowell, and one in Lakeville. And then in Rhode Island, we just have the Providence Satellite Office. I was still in the Boston division, but I was not a part of, I wasn't sitting at an office that was down near New Bedford and Fall River. And why did you want that? Are you from that area? Yeah, I went to college up in New Hampshire, University of New Hampshire, and my wife and I always kind of wanted to get back up to that area. But the other side of it is I had four kids. We were living in Danbury, Connecticut. I was driving an hour and 30 to 40 minutes each way to work in lower Manhattan every day. The cost of living in the New York area we know is high. I was a violent crime agent my time in New York. I oftentimes did not have control of my schedules. We were looking to kind of change things up a little bit. And that's one of the nice things about the FBI is you can do the same job in different areas of the country or world, actually. In April of 2015, I had had mixed feelings about getting involved in this case. Phil and I had mixed feelings after the Bolger case, after it was resolved. But once you start reading and getting involved, it gets in your heart. That's what happened to me. I was a general criminal agent up in the Portland, Maine office. Fortunately, I had a supervisor, Aaron Steps, who knew to let me run on it. He knew it was a compelling and a worthy endeavor to try and figure this case out. I was still working cases up there, but I was fortunate he was less of a bureaucrat with me on that and didn't say, oh, you're up in Maine, you can't work it. And I'm thankful for that. It really helped out. The idea was in looking at this case, we had been on the run for 35 years. Like, what are you going to do? And really, it was the same strategy that we put in place in Boston on the Bolger case in late 2009, 2010. Before you get involved in introducing publicity, do the fundamental investigative stuff, door knocking, interviews, get in people's living rooms, show them you want to solve the case. Bolger was 79 when we started our TDY. He wasn't overseas. He wasn't dead. And Webb was 84. So there's no reason we can't resolve this case. One of the first things I did on the case was I drove from Maine to Saxonburg and I met with the trooper who was assigned the case, Chris Burke-Bickler. And again, I think you show people where you're coming from when you show up in person so much more than you do over an email or a phone call. And I sat down with Chris at the barracks. Chris is the son of a trooper. He actually remembered the day Chief Adams was murdered. 
He was in the car with his dad. His dad drove him home, put his uniform on and went to work. Chris still has a vivid memory of that. So it was kind of unique that we were able to connect on this case and he was able to see it through all the way to the end. I wanted to visit the crime scene. I wanted to review the evidence. I remember sitting in the barracks going through the case file the one night I was there. And I remember a young trooper coming in. He must have been 25, if that. And he came up to me and he said, you know, I remember this case. I grew up in Saxonburg. I remember when the chief was killed. Those things definitely, they sit with you as an investigator. I went through the case file. Brian Fox was the head of the Erie resident agency at the time. He had grown up in Saxonburg and was a help to me as well. He really wanted to see if we could get somewhere with this case. And at the end of the day, Jerry, there was four areas that I wanted to focus on. I wanted to look at forensics and see if maybe something forensics wise could help us in this fugitive case, which isn't very common. You know, in the Bulger case, the breast implants, the serial number, that was really what took us there to get the photographs of Catherine Gregg. And who is to say we might not get something similar in this investigation? We were able to extract a male DNA profile from the blood stain on the floor mat. It always goes to show there's always something new and different you can do with an investigation, even if it's 35 years old. We wanted to focus on the Fall River Gang associates that were still alive. Let's get the reward increase. Maybe someone will talk. Frank Latch, who was on the run with Webb at the time of the murder, we were unclear if he was with Webb when Chief Adams was killed, but we knew he was someone we had to get involved with. And lastly, most importantly, was Webb's wife, Lillian Webb. She was still alive. She was in her early 80s, living down in North Dartmouth, Massachusetts, right outside of New Bedford. Forensically, we got a male DNA profile from that floor mat and we entered it into the CODIS, which really may not mean much, but if Webb had been killed by the mob, which is one of the stories of the case that he came back home and they killed him because he did the unthinkable, he killed a police chief. Maybe he was a unidentified remain somewhere and maybe his DNA put into CODIS could help us resolve this case. Actually, for my interviews with Lillian, I got the name of a periodontist that Webb used to see down in that area. And I went and interviewed him and he had records in his house. He was writing a book and he had Donald Webb's dental records. He had got some gum work done about a year before he killed Chief Adams. So those dental records were remarkable. I actually had them uploaded into NCIC. I had them uploaded into NamUs. I had an odontologist tell me they were the nicest dental records he had ever had submitted for a law enforcement investigation. And you'll see they ended up helping us out. But it goes to show that in these old cases, there's oftentimes always something new that you can do. As the technology improves and changes, so do the possibility of using new law enforcement techniques. Yeah. And just how Pete McCann got lucky having George Bates. I got lucky down in New Bedford at the time. There was an agent named Don Cornick who like me, had done a lot of years in New York City. He was a very accomplished organized crime investigator. And he had also done some violent crime work in the Maryland area as a new agent. He had about 15, 16 years in, and he had gotten his transfer out of New York and was living on Cape Cod. And he was a one-man show in New Bedford. He worked at an offsite with a bunch of the cops down there working gang investigations. So I reached out for Don and he was pretty much my wingman on this whole case. I would drive down from Maine three or four times a month and I'd have a to-do list of things I wanted to do and, and we would get to work. We'd meet at the Dunkin' Donuts, right? Where 140 empties out on Route 6, have a cup of coffee and go to work. I was really fortunate to have Don because he, not only did he have violent crime and organized crime experience, but he had experience talking to the wives of mobsters back in New York. He worked the Colombo family. He was very comfortable in that setting. And he's also a very soft-spoken guy. He's more of a listener than a talker. That really helped complement me and my approach when I'm working cases. And he was partnered with a TFO, John LaPointe, who was a longtime Fall River detective. And they really scoured that area for interviews. We got the reward increased on the 35th anniversary of Chief Adams' death to $100,000 to try and get someone to come out and talk to us. And ironically, just a side story, we did get information from some of these old criminals the ones that were willing to talk to us, that Webb had been buried in a cemetery in eastern Nesquahoning, Pennsylvania, which is down in like the Lehigh Valley near Lehighton and Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, that Webb had been buried in a cemetery. He had died. They used to hang out at a hotel restaurant called Macaluso's and that he had died there. And they buried him under a plot where the next day the actual casket was going to go in for a legitimate funeral. So I spent about three days down there and it turned out to be a dead end lead, but that was the type of information we were trying to cultivate. And Frank Latch, he was Webb's longtime running mate and he was from 
the Warwick, Rhode Island area. So it made sense that the, the getaway car had been dropped there at the Howard Johnson's. It, it, it tied back to the Cranston, Warwick area. And they had done a, a burglary of a jewelry store, wet Webb's crew with Latch on Halloween night in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. And two of them had gotten caught. Webb and Latch had both gotten away. So that's kind of why we think they started to, to move westward in Pennsylvania because, you know, Williamsport's kind of located in the north central part of the state. Latch, like Webb, was a well-dressed, soft-spoken crook. And he, he had direct ties to the mafia. He had married into the Tamelio family. Enrico Tamelio was the underboss of the patriarchal crime family. So these weren't made guys. These were, these were associates. So Latch ends up getting arrested in May of 82 down in Florida with the alias Armand D'Onofrio. FBI was very involved. This, there was a pawn shop down there called the New Hawk Shop. And it was tied to Sam Urbano, who was a Chicago mobster. And they were surveilling that location with the hopes of finding Webb. And they were able to locate and, and arrest Latch. But he never cooperated with us. He did six years in federal prison on a bunch of different charges. And when, when I took over the case, Phil had gone down to inter interview him. And I went down twice. He was at a nursing home in Hollywood, Florida. And he was on dialysis. He was on oxygen. He wasn't in great condition. One of my buddies is Rich Pyres. You know, they don't necessarily make working informants easier in the FBI these days. Rich and I went down. He was more of a source guy than I was. We spent two or three days with Latch trying to get him to give us what he knew about the investigation. Unfortunately, he really didn't give us much help. He basically said, I don't want to betray the life that he chose to live, but we definitely made a run at him. Rich is the CDC in Boston. You never know the places and people this job takes you to is really remarkable. And I have fond memories of watching Rich interview Mr. Latch in that nursing home on a rolling toilet for four hours each day. The visuals from that are just, I hope they pass soon. Did you feel confident that Webb might still be alive and the fact that Latch didn't just say, oh yeah, he died? I mean, it seems like even if you don't want to give up a lot of information about a former partner, if he was dead, then Latch would say he's dead. I can't tell you anymore, but he's dead. But he didn't say that to you. That's right. I really felt there was a good chance this guy could be alive, especially after what happened with the Bolger case. I really felt like there was a chance he could be alive. Eventually, this case came back to Lillian Webb. She was in her early 80s. She was residing alone in a private house in North Dartmouth, Massachusetts, which is right outside of New Bedford. She had moved to this house in 97. So 17 years after the murder, she relocates from New Bedford, where she was living in a house, to a new house in North Dartmouth. And Lillian was known as Diamond Lil. She used to love her diamonds. It was rumored that any diamonds Dom would bring her, she would sew in the hems of her curtains at her house so that she could hide them there. And she was also known as Dakota Lil. She had been a, a singer. There was actually a record in her house with her on it as Dakota Lil. She was a beautiful woman. She was anti-law enforcement, self-sufficient. She had her own successful sales career, which at that time in the 70s and, and early 80s was not super common for a female. She had married Webb in 61, and at the time, she was a widow. Her husband, Stanley Portis, had died of a heart problem in 56, and when she married Webb, she had a young son named Stanley Webb. So the first time we went down to talk to her was about six weeks after I took over the case, and Don and I knocked, and it took her about 45 minutes to come to the door. And she opened the door and I stuck my foot in the screen door and we talked to her through probably a, uh, a three inch opening of the door for 45 minutes. I was recording the interview and I went back up to Maine and she called me the next day and she said, I don't know what happened to my husband. I'm an old woman. Leave me alone. I can't help you out. I don't want you to talk to me anymore. And I said, Lillian, this is the murder of a police chief we're talking about here. We're trying to get results on this case. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll just deal with you for the first couple of months of this investigation. I'm not going to talk to your friends. I'm not going to talk to your neighbors. I'm just going to talk to you. If you give us the time, I'm not going to come down every day. And she said, no, I really don't want you to come down. I really don't want to talk to you. She never invoked counsel. She never completely shut the door. So I went down two or three more times and we couldn't get into the house. She wouldn't open the door. And then finally on the fourth time, I brought some photos with me. Basic salesmanship. I said, hey, Lillian, we got these photos we found from Don's family out in California. We wanted to show you. We're trying to find out who these people are. And she was an older woman living alone, probably pretty lonely. She let us in and Don and I sat in the living room for two hours and talked to her. She took a liking to Don. I don't know if it was his first name or his low key matter, but she really liked him. And that helped. That really helped us. We eventually, Jerry, got her immunity for her and her brother who was living in the area. Very difficult to get immunity from the prosecutor's office in Butler County for the murder of a police chief, but we got her immunity, a letter. 
Matter of fact, I brought the letter on two occasions to attorney Cicilline's office in Rhode Island, and he never called me back, never reached out for me. So eventually I said, you know what? I brought the letter to his house and I gave it to his wife in her bathrobe at eight o'clock one morning. I said, please make sure your husband sees this letter. We want to resolve this case. I bring that up because as FBI agents, one of the nice things about our job is people can't really control who we talk to. I mean, if people don't want to talk to us, they can decide not to talk to us. Or if their attorney calls, then we have to abide by that. That's one of the nice things I loved about being an agent is you can always go out and speak to people. And oftentimes you learn something new every time you talk to someone. How many times before when this investigation was active at the beginning of all of this, could you tell me how many times agents had attempted to speak to Lillian and how many times she actually allowed them to sit down and talk to her? In my judgment from talking to the former agents and reviewing the case file, they probably had two sit-down interviews with her in the early part of the investigation. And then she just closed them off and they were following her and she was doing surveillance detection moves in the streets when they were following her. So it got pretty contentious and she never forgave the FBI. She said they went to her work and kind of blew her up at work. And that always bothered her, really bothered her. So I would say two or three times interviews were conducted in recent years, in the 15 years before I took over the case, she had not been spoken to in a long time. A long time. I would say she had not been spoken to since 2000. Oh, that's really interesting. And you're right. It could just be that at that point she was lonely. She was now, you said, in her early 80s and kind of ready to talk. Yeah, I think the timing was right. Phil has a saying, he likes to take people out of their comfort zone. And I think that was, you know, instead of being on our heels with a case like this, we went on our toes. And it was the same thing with the Bulger case. Like, we're going to get out and speak to people whether they like it or not. I think people usually are receptive to us. From April of 15 to November of 16, we recorded about eight surreptitiously recorded interviews of Lillian Webb, Don Cornick and I, and we probably tried to talk to her 15 to 20 times. And on November 16th of 2016, so about a year and six months after I took over this case, we executed a search warrant at her residence. And you got to give credit to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston for helping me get the warrant through. It was a limited scope search warrant. Our only authorization was to get in that house and seize photographs of Donald Eugene Webb. The PC for the warrant was false statements to FBI agents because we had determined she had photos of Webb and kept telling us she did not. It was an aggressive search warrant. We were able to get in the house. That was conducted in November of 16. And I remember driving down the night before the warrant, and I spoke to Fred Roberson, who in my judgment was the last true case agent on this investigation. Fred retired, I believe, in the mid-90s. And Fred said, Tommy, you got to be really heads up when you do this search warrant because these guys were the type of criminals that had hidden rooms, they had hidden compartments, they'd hide things in their sewer tanks. So if you're going to search that house, you got to make sure you got that in mind. I briefed our evidence response team on that the following morning. And lo and behold, one of the gals on the ERT team, I was going through a closet and she sees something that doesn't look right and she finds a hidden room. When I say hidden room, it was a room specifically designed to hide a person. You would walk into the room. It was probably a little bit bigger than a shower stall in size. And you'd had a hook lock on the top where you'd walk in and then lock it. There was no lighting in the room. Inside, there was a stool to sit down on. There was a magic cane hanging on the wall, which is relevant because Webb supposedly suffered this leg injury. And then there was three boxes in the corner of the room of Kennedy half dollars. So it was a bunch of silver change in there. We tried to get a federal search warrant to seize those items and we were denied. We went at Lillian pretty hard about the room because now the whole complexion of the case has changed. Like, don't tell us you don't know where your husband is who killed a cop because we just searched her house and we found a room designed to hide a fugitive, hide a person. So her story no longer has any weight and she knew it. We knew it. Unfortunately, we lost the ability to interview her now that we searched her house. That was over and she lost the ability to throw that story at law enforcement. When you said she lost the, you lost that ability because at that point she lawyered up again. She didn't. She actually did not invoke counsel, but we knew that she was never going to let us in the house to talk to us again after we executed a search warrant at six o'clock in the morning. Had any other agent, again, there, there was a point when the murder first happened that agents were all over the case. And then there was almost a 15 year period where nothing really happened on the case. Early on, had they conducted a search of the web home? Yeah, they had been in her address in Hawthorne. She lived on Hawthorne Street by the hospital in New Bedford. And the original investigators had been in that house. Later on, they had cameras set up. They were surveilling the house. They were doing trash pulls. But the new house in 97, no one had been in. 
And not only that, but a lot of the neighbors hadn't been spoken to. So they didn't even know that the wife of a top 10 fugitive was living next door. And she moved into that house in 1997. I point that out because in law enforcement, this happens a lot with a lot of investigations. They go through peaks and valleys of energy. It's so important when you have these cases to have fresh eyes and people assigned with energy, positive energy. Let's talk about that energy because, yeah, there could have been other agents who were assigned this case in the past. And since it was an open case, as you said, open versus active, it had been on somebody else's caseload over this period of time. But what was it about this case that gave you energy, that made you go the extra step? I mean, this is why I joined the FBI to work cases like this. These cases are the ones I read on the beach during the summer. I bring a folder with me and read it. Like, I, I love these cases. And then we all know there's agents in the FBI that really love traveling, working overseas. They love firearms. They love evidence recovery. But you know, I'm a case guy. I worked cases for 20 years. This is the stuff that I love. And this is the stuff I'll miss. That's it. And I'll tell you, when we were talking to Lillian after we found the room, I was doing most of the talking and Don Cornick was doing most of the listening. And he picked up that Lillian seemed pretty concerned about being sued civilly. I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, older folks, they are worried about money and having money coming in every month because they're not able to earn money. And I think Don picked that up and that was pretty helpful as we moved on. We seized about 40 photographs of Webb, really good photos. If you go online and look, they're just so different from the black and white photos the Bureau had for all those years. They're just so different. Photographs are so important in fugitive cases. We released those to the media in the early part of 2017. This is after the search. But you look at those photos, it was the same thing with Bolger's girlfriend, Kathy Gregg. It's a totally different likeness. It's if someone out there had seen, had been living next to Webb, or maybe he had gotten remarried living out on the West Coast, they would have recognized him. Where if you looked at the top 10 poster or the IO order photo, it would not have helped us get that tip that we needed. It just um, didn't look like him. Yeah. The photos we see were really, it's a whole different guy. Did it appear that any of these photos that she had that you were able to seize, did it appear that any of these had been taken after he killed the police chief? Were they newer photos or they were all photos before 1980? Before 1980. We couldn't say that any of them were taken afterwards. Okay. Yeah, we were hoping for that. We were hoping to see something in the house. And we were, we were able to photograph everything in the house. We were open to see, you know, a, an address or a bank account or something that would help us that we could photograph, but we only had the authority to seize the photos. And we were hoping with the publicity, the photos might give us a tip that would resolve this case, whether Webb was alive or dead. The Boston photographer actually took a video of this hidden room and you've been able to send that to me. So I'm going to make sure to have that video of the little hidden room in Lillian Webb's house included in the show notes for this episode. That's pretty cool. So thank you for, for sharing that with us. Yeah, you're welcome. We got a great photography team in Boston, Michelle Gamble and Rick Rhoda. I can't tell you how many cases they've helped me on and other agents. And Rick came down and did that for us when we were doing one of the warrants down there. So we released the photos. There was an SOG team in Boston that was a bunch of senior agents that were kind of burnt out working cases. And they were the perfect crew to help me on this case. The team leader was Chuck Prunier. It was the gold team. Chuck's father was an FBI agent. He knew all about Donald Eugene Webb. So in between their terrorism cases and all the other stuff that they were doing surveillance for, they really focused on, the, on that case and followed Lillian. And she knew she was being watched. She was getting pretty tired of the attention from not only me and Don, but from our surveillance teams as well. In June, I reached out for Mrs. Jones and I was frustrated because the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston has a policy where they don't unseal warrants, search warrants. And I was always accustomed to as long as you're not revealing source information or sensitive information, all warrants get unsealed unless you do an order to keep them sealed. But it's not the case in Boston. So we were never able to get out the fact that we found this room or the stuff leading up to the warrant. When I reached out for the chief's widow, Mary Ann Jones, she had remarried. Her name was now Mary Ann Jones. And I spoke to her and she had an attorney, Tom King, who was very helpful to us out of Butler. And I said, listen, would you guys be willing to, to sign some kind of form releasing Lillian from civil liability if she were to help us resolve this case and, and give it up? And their response was, the heck with that. Let's sue her. That was great because that civil lawsuit allowed the hidden room to get out to the media. Wow. And, and the fact that this woman, this little innocent old lady 
who said she never heard from her husband, now has a hidden room in her house. That creates a lot of pressure publicly on a person, uh, whether it's her grandkids getting something on Facebook or whatever, but it, it definitely puts pressure on someone, particularly an older woman. The collection totally changed with the room. I wanted to be with the sheriff's deputy when he served her with the civil suit. So we had surveillance following Lillian. The deputy hopped in my car and he had the summons with him. And a blue-lighted Lillian, she pulled over on a side street. She had a little white dog in the back. And the deputy got out with the summons and approached her car. And she saw me walk around my Buick car and she put the car in drive and flew off on a residential street and went, made a U-turn, came blowing right by us. I told the deputy, I said, the last thing we want to do is chase her because that's the last thing we need is the little old lady with her white dog barking at me, us getting into a chase, someone getting hurt. We went back to the house and he ended up sliding the summons under the front door. That story illustrates kind of the resistance we were dealing with as case agents. When you're active on cases, good things come your way. And I got a call from Dirk Bickler in Pennsylvania who had received a call from Detective Mike Shervin, a Massachusetts State Police detective, really competent investigator with homicide experience. Mike had been working at the gaming unit for the attorney general's office, and they had an investigation going on, which I can't talk about because it's still an ongoing case, but the subject was Stanley Webb, and it had to do with illegal gambling, gaming machines, Joker poker type machines and establishments. Stanley Webb was Lillian's son, and at the time of the murder of Chief Adams, he had actually been a police officer in New Bedford. And George Bates, the agent, had actually been his firearms instructor at the range. Don and I had interviewed him on this case, and he had been interviewed previously, and he claimed he had no idea where Webb was, and that Webb wasn't really too much of a father figure to him, wasn't around too much. But you know, in late June, for about six months, Jerry, after this hidden room search warrant, the state police executed about 100 search warrants at businesses tied to Stanley Webb and his residents and other residences connected to the family. So this really shook up Lillian. And this is really an unrelated case, but it's still going to have an effect on what your, I guess she's a witness, <laughs> an uncooperative witness is uh, going to say. Yeah, unrelated, but very important because those four Massachusetts troopers, Mike Shervin, Kevin Barry was his, was his boss, uh, lieutenant there, and uh, Loman Chang was another trooper. And I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the name of the lieutenant, but they realized that they were touching on a case that pertained to the murder of a police officer. And this became their case. It became our, our case, but this was something they were really happy to help out with. And we worked tremendously together on it. I showed them everything I did on the case. There was no secrets, not that there ever should be. We worked well together. They provided a lot of great momentum in the final stages of the case. So those search warrants happened. And then a day after the gaming search warrants, through the troopers, they felt we could get back in Lillian's house and do a piggyback search warrant and seize the items in the hidden room. So this is now not a federal search warrant, it's a state search warrant. We did that about a day after these 100 search warrants. And we went to the house and uh, we seized all the items in the hidden room. And I even remember one of the troopers was walking in the front of the house with the, the actual door to the hidden room. And Lillian looked out the window and I was standing up there talking to her. And she said, what are they doing with the door? I said, well, Lillian, there's a thing called touch DNA right now. And we're going to process that door and we're going to find Don's DNA and you're going to die in federal prison. And she let out this sigh, this natural response to what I was saying, like, oh my gosh. And then the next day I get a call from Chuck Pruny, or I'm actually mowing my lawn. Chuck calls me and says, hey, Tommy, we're taking Lillian to Federal Hill. She just went to see Cicilline, the attorney. I knew we were about to break her. I thought you said you got her immunity. So why would a statement that she's going to die in federal prison mean she's got immunity. What could she have been charged with? Well, that's the thing. She really got immunity from nothing, Jerry. There was nothing they could have charged her with in Pennsylvania. There was no crime on the books of Pennsylvania that they could have charged her with. And there was no crime in Massachusetts because Massachusetts has a privilege, a spousal privilege. So there was no charge that the state could charge her with in Massachusetts. The only charge that I was aware of in this case would have been 1001 lying to the FBI. And I had several recorded interviews where she said she had no idea where Don was. So if we had his DNA in the house on a door in a hidden room, we certainly could have charged her with that. And I'll tell you, I get the phone call from Chuck and momentum is really building. I'm like, man, we got a chance to actually solve this case. This guy's been on the run for 37 years and we're going to, we're going to fit. He may still be alive. You just don't know. And uh, man, I get a call from executive management in Boston and they basically say, you got two or three weeks to wrap up this case. We're going to reassign it to the Pittsburgh division. And what? I, yeah, I'm dumbfounded. And I'm saying to myself, how 
how is this? I'm a, we're all FBI agents here. I'm working this case. This guy murdered a cop and we're finally getting somewhere on this case. What's the rationale? I mean, did somebody request it back because they saw you were having momentum or, or what? I'm pretty sure a lot of the agents working violent crime in Pittsburgh didn't even know who Donald Eugene Webb was. To be honest with you, he was off the top 10 list. These are the new generation agents. My personal opinion on this, I'm allowed to share my opinion now that I'm retired, is a lot of our management, the FBI now, has just counterterrorism experience and they don't have criminal experience. And they're more focused on you know, preventing something bad from happening, running a command post and making sure no bombs go off. But when you're working a case like this that the media is going to latch on to and that is other agencies, you're doing multiple warrants, some state, some federal, it creates a lot of pressure, a lot of scrutiny. Things aren't always perfect in law enforcement when you're dealing with people. And I think that was just too much for management. They were like, why are we working this case? It should be a Pittsburgh case, which is completely ridiculous, if you know what I mean. But I just think that's what FBI agents are faced with. And in my judgment, if you were to talk to a lot of working FBI agents that work cases, they would say the biggest battles they fought was with their own management. Oftentimes you're swimming against the tide as a case agent, which I think sometimes is why some folks don't get in the water. But I, it was really deflating to me. Imagine. Yeah. Particularly since we had had success on the Bolger case, which is a pretty important investigation in Boston, given all the corruption that went on. But I just couldn't believe now I was finally getting somewhere that I had to have these sleepless nights because of a decision to reassign the case to another division. But you know what the nice thing about it is, Jerry, is the case agent, the will of the case agent won on this. And within the next two weeks, we resolved this case. You resolved it before it actually got transferred. That's correct. I get the call from Chuck Prunier, and then I get a call from the DA in Pennsylvania. And she says, Cicilline called. They want to do a sit-down interview. His clients had enough. And on July 13th, 2017, we did an interview at Lillian's residence with her lawyer, Jack Cicilline, and then the investigative team was there. And in their impression, this was immunity. They would tell us what they knew, then the FBI would leave her alone and she would not face any charges. It was a coordinated interview. We had Chris Burke Bickler lead the interview because he was the trooper from Pennsylvania and he had less exposure to Lillian. By that point, she was done with me, done with Don, done with the state troopers. Chris took the lead and we knew going into the interview, Jerry, they had proffered a day or two before that Webb was buried in the backyard and that that's what she was going to tell us. So we knew that coming in. She's told us during the interview that Webb had died of natural causes on December 30th, 1999. He had suffered a stroke a few years before and had told her, Lillian, you need to start digging a grave for me in the back. I'm not going to live much longer. She dug the grave herself, she said, and then he passed away on December 30th. She said he weighed only a little bit over 100 pounds because he had been sick. She put his body in a bin, a bin you would store things in, dragged it down the stairs, out the backyard, and dumped it in a hole she had built right in the side of the shed in her tree-covered backyard. And if you look at the photos I sent you, it's, it is a perfect place to, to bury a body. I believe she bought that house so he could live there in his later years when he was sick. And that's what she had said. She told us Webb had returned home to Massachusetts right after the murder. His lower lip was almost entirely bit off in the struggle with Chief Adams, and he had a severe fracture of his lower leg. She checked him into Toby Hospital, which is in Wareham, Mass., closer to Cape Cod, about 25 minutes east of New Bedford, under an alias, and that she and a friend of hers who was now dead had driven the getaway car to the Howard Johnsons and parked at the Howard Johnsons, cleaned the car out and left. She said Webb had lived off and on with her for 17 years, and as his health failed, she bought the house in North Dartmouth because it was a better place to hide. I interviewed the previous owners of the house. Not only did they say they had no hidden room in the house, we showed them the photographs, but they also said that the older woman they sold it to wanted a downstairs space so she could have her dog be downstairs, which was probably Webb she was thinking about. After the interview concluded, we all walked outside. She dug her heel into the ground. Like I used the analogy, like a kid would make a batter's box for playing like wiffle ball at the beach or something around the dirt. And she dug her heel right in the side, right around the shed. And, uh, and told us Webb was in there. I remember like before we started the dig right after, I remember talking to Cicilline real quick. And I said, you did the right thing here. It was about time. And he almost broke down and started crying, which was for a mob attorney. I mean, he's an older guy. This must've been something he knew about for years. And he kind of in his own way felt like that he was getting it off his chest. So 
We immediately started a body dig led by the Mass State Police. They had obtained a search warrant just for the purposes of the dig. Great symbolic message. The Saxonburg chief of police and the mayor drove all the way out to be there for the dig. So we parked their patrol car right in front of Lillian's house. Kind of a message saying that law enforcement's prevailed in this 37-year investigation. I had goosebumps when you said that. It's very symbolic of law enforcement and never giving up. Yeah. And if you work a case like this, you realize the resistance, even 35, 36 years later that I faced working the case, just dealing with the other side, dealing with the criminal world. It just took a lot to get that to break. We were successful in doing that. The remains were dug up. It was just as Lillian said, he was buried in the shirt. She said he died in. She showed us the bin. She had put lime down. There was evidence of lime. I called the case guys on this case, the folks that worked it. I try and be good about keeping them engaged. This case meant so much to the retired agents. They never really got over the fact that they never figured this case out. I reached out for Jack McGrath. He was the one agent that lived down in that area. I invited him over to the dig. The other agents really couldn't get there, regrettably. This kind of happened relatively quick, Jerry. Jack shows up. He's probably close to 80, 78, 80 years old. And he's barely walking. He put his suit on to come there. He said, he goes, I wore my Hoover suit for this. And he shows up and he's, he's having trouble getting up the lawn. And he goes over and he peeks behind the shed where they're digging. He comes back and he says to me, hey, Tommy, I wouldn't be surprised if they find his 22. Webb was always believed to have that 22 on him. And wouldn't you believe about two hours later, the first thing we dig up is Webb's 22 revolver. Wow. And she actually buried him with it. Mm. The next day, the autopsy was done in Boston. The dental records that we found out came up big. We were able to identify them through dental records very quickly. It ended almost a 37-year fugitive investigation and just over a two-year cold case fugitive investigation. We were able to confirm the leg injury. Had he been shot? He had not been shot, according to what Lillian told us. The blood was from his lip and from his leg injury, but it was a compound fracture. So he was in the hospital for a while. We tried to get the records from Toby Hospital, but they didn't have records that went back that far. Well, just Uh, think, even back then, if he had been shot, then there was a better chance of them reporting that to law enforcement. But she must have made up some type of story or lie about how he broke his leg. But boy, if he had been shot in the leg, then this might have been resolved much earlier. It was great because we did the interview on a Thursday and the autopsy was on a Friday. And that Saturday and Sunday was the 175th anniversary of the town of Saxonburg. The mayor, the chief, Chris Burke Bickler, the Pennsylvania guys were able to go home to a big celebration and be able to bring the small town the news that law enforcement had located Webb. The U.S. Attorney's Office declined any charges of Lillian for 1001. She was never chargeable in mass in Pennsylvania. That was something I don't think she knew or her attorney knew. It was great to finally resolve this case. I remember, you know, as case agents, you end up like you feel like there's a hole in the side of your head from being on the phone so much and and all the stuff you're worried about. And I had a few sleepless nights for some of the stuff I talked about. I remember getting home to Maine and going out to Chinese food with my son, one of my sons, and I'm sitting there at the restaurant having a beer, eating Chinese food, and my phone rings and it's George Bates, who was one of the initial case agents on the case. That was pretty cool. That was a pretty good moment to hear from one of the original case agents and for him to say, yeah, he was pretty emotional for him to say, wow, this, this is great. That yeah, was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, and I can hear, even though you're trying to hide it, I can hear the emotion in your voice. This meant a lot to you. Yeah, it was a great case. And I'll tell you, I'll end with most agents in the FBI, when you're doing the grind of working cases, and I don't know, you could talk to other agents. I mean, 10, 15, 20, 25% of our workforce is really doing the grind of casework, in my judgment. I got asked to go out to Pennsylvania the following fall for a ceremony, and they inducted me into the Brady Paul Memorial Lodge, which is a Pennsylvania State Police group that honors the life of a trooper killed in the line of duty back in the 20s. And Dan McKnight was the head of that, was the head of the event. He was a former trooper that had worked this case. That meant a heck of a lot to get that honor. I got to meet Mary Ann Jones in person. I had spoken to her several times and I had a great hug with her. She was very emotional. Her and her family, her two sons, they didn't get the justice that they wanted. They wanted someone in handcuffs. They wanted their day in court. But she did tell me that the following December 4th was the first time in her life since the murder of her husband that she never wondered where Donald Webb was. So that might have been the best that we could do on the case. I got to meet all the cops, the troopers, the lab folks out there that worked the case and their families. This case meant a lot to the people of Saxonburg. 
We had baseball bats made up. Lou Ledoux is a Fall River businessman. He owns Axis Bats and they make baseball bats for a lot of the major leaguers. Really impressive place in where else? Fall River, Mass. So we had bats made up with black and gold for the Steelers and the Pirates and we gave them to all the investigators. I got to meet Gordon Mainhart, who was the chief's partner, who was with him when he died in the ambulance. My wife and I had beers with him and his wife at the VFW in downtown Saxonburg. What a great honor that is. Driving home with my wife, I was saying, I said, I wish other agents that worked cases like this. And you know the FBI, we have so many different violations. We have so many agents doing great work. And, and what do you usually get after you do a great case, right? Well, you got to do discovery, get your stuff to the prosecutor, get right. ready for trial. So... <laughs> It just, this event was like, I have so many agents that I'm friends with. And I said, and, and I wish they could have experienced that type of appreciation is what I'm trying to say. Well, this has been a fantastic case review. And I think everyone listening could feel your passion for working cases, that passion of trying to resolve the unknown and to make sure people responsible for a crime, that the victims get justice. At the time Lillian said that her husband died, that Donald Eugene Webb died, she would have been in her early 60s. And as a person who's in her early 60s, I know I could probably go out in the back and dig a hole and bury my husband. Not that I would ever do that. Do you believe that she did that on her own or do you believe that she had help, maybe even her son? Or do you not want to speculate on that? No, I mean, I think a woman that spent two years lying on my face certainly could be lying again. And she's only telling us what she wants so that she doesn't get charged and we technically leave her alone. But just the fact that she took off on us and we served the summons in her early 80s kind of shows you what her resolve is. I think it was possible that she dug the hole, got Webb out there and buried him. I know for a fact she didn't build that hidden room and she she wasn't able to talk about that. Like we weren't able to get that out of her, like who actually built the room. So she obviously had someone helping her out in regards to that. So I, I think it's it's within possibility that what she said was true and accurate. But in the interview with her attorney, she never talked about where Webb was living. She didn't want to bring anyone else into this case and get them exposed. I knew we weren't going to get that from her if someone had helped her bury him. Well, this is, again, a fantastic case review. And you've mentioned Whitey Bolger many times. And I hope sometime in the near future to have someone on to talk about that fugitive hunt, because that is another great case. You mentioned implants, et cetera, and with some really fascinating twists and turns that helped the FBI resolve that case and to capture another top 10 most wanted fugitive. My partner, Phil Torzi, and I, we've spoken to folks before about the work we did on that case, and that's really all we can speak about. I think half of the FBI still thinks that we took an ad out in the paper, and that's how we caught Bolger out in Santa Monica. There was a lot of work done in Boston to make that case happen. Very good. We're at the part of the episode where we learn a little bit more about you. When and why did you join the FBI? So I joined the FBI in the summer of 96. I was two years out of college. I had worked in the private sector for a bit. I was an SSG investigative specialist in New York. I went to law school at night. It was one of my lifelong goals to be an FBI agent. I was able to get out of law school, graduate from Fordham Law and get into the FBI in 2000 and reported to New York. And proud to say my first squad in the FBI was the Joint Bank Robbery Task Force, which was the first ever task force with the FBI and the NYPD. Lenny Hatton, the agent we lost on 9-11 down at the Twin Towers, sat caddy corner to me in the squad area. So I was very fortunate not only to get the New York office out of the gate, but also to be on that particular squad. You were in for, did you say 20 years? Yes, ma'am, 20 years. And so when you retired, because we all know FBI agents, most of them, (laughs) after you retire, you're not really retired. What are you doing now? So I kind of switched gears. I wanted to do something totally different than law enforcement or or security or regulatory type work. I went into sales. I'm a software sales rep. I cover all New England for a great company called ULab, which is a medical device industry startup company. We sell software to orthodontists and I cover all New England. So I spend a lot of time in the car these days doing something totally different than my prior career, but I'm trying to put my four kids through college. I like to give my guests the last word. So what would you like to say? 
Well, I guess in going on with the web case, the Christmas of, I think it was December of 19 or 18, I was sitting up in my office in Portland. It was Christmas, early December is one of those times. It was obviously the anniversary of Chief Adams' death, but it's also a time where my wife and I are usually trying to figure out where we're going to get money to buy gifts for the kids, right? You know, got four kids. Can we borrow from the thrift? What are we going to do this year to come up with that extra couple hundred bucks? And then at that time, we were heading into another government shutdown where FBI employees weren't getting paid. Stressful time. I get a letter in the mail. It used to be wrote our secretary, Cindy, hands it to me. And I open it up and it's a card from Gordon Mainhart, who was Chief Adams' partner. In it, he included one of two badges for Chief Adams, which was just a uh, an awesome gift to get. To think an FBI agent working in Portland, Maine could get that in the mail. I mean, you think about your career, right? Who really cares what your performance evaluation is, meet expectations or outstanding? You know, who really cares if you retire as an SSRA, an ASAC or an SAC? But to get that in the mail from the partner of a police chief killed in the line of duty, I think shows that in the FBI, you have the potential to do some really great things. And I think the more the FBI focuses on working cases and helping law enforcement, we're going to continue to be one of the best organizations in the world. And that's the end of the interview. In your podcast app's description of this episode, you'll find a link to the show notes on my website for this episode, where you'll find a photo of Tommy McDonald and many of the agents and law enforcement partners who he worked with on this case. There's also a copy of Donald Eugene Webb's One It Flyer and several images taken during the recovery of Webb's remains that were buried in his backyard. Plus, don't forget, there's that evidence video where we get to look at the secret hideout built in a closet inside Webb's residence. And I've included a link where you can listen to more FBI retired case file review fugitive focused cases. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. You can show me just how much you liked it by buying me a coffee. There's a link in your podcast app's description of this episode, or you can visit jerrywilliams.com and tap on the little coffee cup icon in the bottom right-hand corner of my website. Don't forget to follow FBI Retired Case File Review on your favorite podcast app. Now, this podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, Once a month, via my reader team email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, a colorful list of more than 70 books about the FBI written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There's nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You'll also get my FBI reality checklist, where I debunk 20 cliches about the FBI and receive news about what I'm up to and about my FBI nonfiction and crime fiction books. I want to thank you for listening to the very end. I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.